Well, good morning, Watermark Fort Worth. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, my name's Steve Abney, and I have the privilege of uh, serving on our elder team, and uh, just really excited to get to share this time with you. Um, I was in the, the green room, which is kind of the pre-meeting before we come out here, and Connor, with a very serious look on his face, said, hey, when you go up there, do you need water and tissues? And uh, if, you, if you heard me teach last time, you know why that's really funny. And I said, no, I'm good. And I couldn't even make it through that worship set, man. <laughs> but it was just so delightful to hear your voices uh, sing praises to the Lord. So just really excited to get to be here with you this morning. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, my uh, wife and daughters and I got to have lunch with our first uh, missionary uh, couple um, who's departing in a matter of weeks uh, to go to Central Asia. And it was just such an encouraging conversation, uh, or just our time together and just getting to hear uh, their heart as they uh, go overseas and, and leave this church family um, with our support and our prayers and, and a team to, to pray for them and support them. Uh, but when they left, they left us with a gift. And uh, the gift was this uh, children's book um, called Worldviews. And it's a children's introduction to missions. Um, and its purpose is to, to bring awareness uh, to the need of missions to unreached people groups around the world. And it does so by having kids uh, learn about the primary worldviews that exist um, outside of Christianity and then comparing them and, and then learning how to share the gospel with those folks and then uh, really understanding their belief system, what they believe, what their fears are, what their sense of good and evil is. And you know, these include like tribalism, Hinduism, um, the unreligious uh, Muslim and Buddhism is kind of what it walks through. And so I've been reading this, this book with um, my two oldest daughters, um, Evan, who's here this morning, and, and Faye. And uh, it's been really sweet to go through it. So Evan's about 10. She turns 10 in a couple days. And then Faye's uh, turning 5 in August. And so we've been reading that together at night. It's kind of like a workbook, working through it. And uh, Faye, uh, she just sits there and sucks her thumb the whole time and offers up distractions. Uh, we're, I know she's about to be five. We're, we're really going to start working on that here real soon. Um, but Evan, our 10-year-old, um, has been really engaged with this book. Um, and so up until this point, she's been um, aware of the category of people that um, are you know, generally local to us that um, have heard about Jesus but have not accepted Jesus. Um, but largely unaware of the categories of people who have not heard about Jesus and have entirely different concepts of belief. And it's caused her to ask some really deep questions um, as we spent some time together. And so uh, the other night, as we were finishing one of the chapters on the tribal people, uh, she asked me, how do we know that what we believe is true and what the tribal people believe isn't? I mean, what a great question uh, to ask. And I said, well, you know, we have something that um, the tribal people don't. Um, while the tribal people share their, their stories about their ancestors and the spirits they believe uh, through word of mouth, uh, what we have is a book that claims to be the word of God. And uh, what's unique about the Bible is its reliability. And I talked a little bit about the amount of Old Testament prophecy that's been fulfilled in the New Testament. You know, it's been said that uh, this is a book that even if man could write, he wouldn't because it demeans man and exalts God. And that this is a book that even if man would write, he couldn't because of the volume of prophecy uh, is outside, that's been fulfilled is outside the ability of man to predict apart from divine intervention. I, I explained how the Bible is comprised of 66 books and written by over 40 authors in three languages and uh, over a span of 1,500 years, and, and, and somehow it shares this theme all throughout of redemption. Um, I got to share about the profession of the Bible, how... Um, and we've already covered some of this in Luke 1, how Luke gathered eyewitness accounts. Um, and as well as in 2 Peter 1.16 that cites that the Bible is, in the New Testament, is comprised of eyewitnesses accounts of what Christ's ministry was. And it's claimed to be um, the, God's word himself in, in first, sorry, 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, and 
for training in righteousness. And I explained about the personal testimony of other Christians like the disciples. Um, All except John suffered a martyr's death for their faith and not one of them recanted. You know, if this was an elaborate ruse, surely one of them would have uh, admitted that to save their hide. And I forgot to mention this, the production of the Bible, uh, the number of ancient copies we have, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, just the archaeology, all validating the re- reliability of the text we have today. And so another way of asking the question Evan, Evan asked the other night was, can I trust God's word? Can I trust his word? And what I was really trying to show was that what we have is reliably the word of God. And our faith is relying on that word as to what is true. And it's on this basis that that we are saved. So turn with me real quick to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And I'm going to read about 11 verses here. It says, Therefore... Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character hope, and it does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For it is while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death, through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And it's by believing this word as true that we as sinners, that Christ accomplished our justification before God in our reconciliation with God through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And we receive the gift of forgiveness by grace through faith. And our faith isn't just a general belief in a higher power that has no origin or source of revelation. Our faith is rooted in something. It has to lay hold of something, and that something is the word of God that our faith is shaped, formed, and placed in God in what he has revealed about himself in scripture, which is why we together affirm the inspiration, infallibility, and authority of God's word. Faith is ultimately believing God's word simply because it was God who said it. Now let's turn to Hebrews 11. I'm going to read a few passages here. Hebrews 11, 1, is this kind of hall of fame passage of faith. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death and he was not found because God took him up for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned about God, warned by God about things not seen, not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. 
by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man in him a good as dead as that as many descendants, as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. In the last verse I'm going to read, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And so how were they acting in faith? They were relying and responding to what God had told them. God told Noah to build an ark and as crazy as that surely sound, since God said it, he did it. God told Abraham to leave his home to a new place that he did not know. He didn't even know where he was going, but because God said it, he trusted him and did it. Sarah, beyond the ability to conceive a child, but God said she'd have descendants as as numerable as the sand, and since God said it, she believed. I love how it says she considered him faithful who had promised. She heard his word, considered God faithful to follow through on his promises. Sarah had faith. Faith is putting your trust in what God has revealed as being true simply because he is the one who said it. That's what was commendable as examples of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And it's precisely not doing that that Jesus is going to rebuke the disciples for in this morning's passage. Because they're going to need a strong rooted faith for what will soon happen as Jesus heads to the cross. So now let's please turn to this morning's text, which is Luke 9, uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 37 through 45. We're going to read that and then pray and then understand what God wants us to learn from this passage. Luke chapter 9, 37 through 45. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain... A large crowd met him, and a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out. And they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. And while he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. For the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement. And it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. Let me pray. God, we thank you for your word, that it's reliable, that we can trust it, that it's come from you. We affirm just the authority of your word in our lives and ask this morning that you would teach us through it, that you would convict us of areas of our lives where we have become faithless, where the things that we see seem too big for you to handle. God, would you move our hearts toward faith this morning as we read this text? Would you Draw those who do not know you to receive you by faith 
that they may be reconciled to you for all eternity. God, lead us this morning. We trust your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So last week, Jason covered um, the incredible mountaintop experience of the transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John were allowed to have their faith confirmed by sight. They got to go up on a mountain with Jesus and see God remove the veil and the glory of Jesus be displayed. And Jesus was affirmed by the law and prophets, and Jesus is affirmed by the Heavenly Father. And then soon after this unfathomable experience, they're heading back down the mountain into the valley, which creates this stark contrast. On the mountain, we have faith by sight, and in the valley, faith in things that you can't see. On the mountain where God reigned, and in the valley where Satan was reigning. On the mountain where the father said, this is my son, listen to him, to in the valley where they weren't listening to him. On the mountain where humanity experienced glorification in the presence of God, and in the valley where humanity experienced suffering under the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so we're off the mountain, down into the valley, and here's what happens. Jesus, Peter, James, and John are coming back down the mountain, and a crowd sees Jesus and is moving towards him, and a man with his son rushes ahead to get there first and stops Jesus, and in total desperation, asks Jesus to look at his son, who has been tormented by demons since childhood. And he tells him that he had begged the other nine disciples to cast out the demon, but they couldn't. And that's when Jesus said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? I mean, that sounds pretty intense coming from Jesus. And it kind of reminds me of like when a parent tells a child, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed, you know? And uh, can you just imagine being one of those nine disciples and, and hearing this? Am I frustrating Jesus? Is he disappointed in me? Like, what did I do wrong? Why did Jesus react this way? I mean, after all, this is probably the most extreme case of legitimate demon possession ever recorded in human history. I mean, when, did Jesus really expect them to be able to handle this situation? And so what are we to make of Jesus' reaction to this. So let's look back at the beginning of chapter 9, back in verse 1, which explains his reaction here. Chapter uh, 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, And he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. So by his spoken word, he gave them power. He gave them authority over all the demons, all, all of the demons, even this one. Which means they had encountered this man requesting that they heal his son. And they had the power, they had the authority, they had the experience, but they didn't have the what? faith. They didn't have the faith. That's why he called them an unbelieving and perverted generation. Perverted meaning twisted or warped. I uh, recently uh, reread a Tozier quote, A.W. Tozier, that says, I believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to an imperfect and ignoble, ignoble thought of God. That somehow when we get a twisted view of God, that uh, that results in error. And I think that's what he meant by perverted, being twisted or warped view of Jesus and what he meant. But this situation just seemed to the disciples to be too extreme for God's word to be reliable. It must just fall out this, outside of the scope of what Jesus meant when he said, they had the power and authority of all. When he said all, did he really mean all? Like even this demon that seemed extreme? 
See, the disciples failed in this moment. They had the authority, they had the power, but it didn't work. And it didn't work because in the moment, they stopped believing God. They just stopped believing that what Jesus had said was true. And it's, it's really the exact same thing that happened to Peter uh, back in Matthew 14. Let's, I'm going to read that. Matthew 14, 22 through 31. It says, immediately he, Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. And he said, come. And Jesus, or sorry, and Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You see, the fear became too great. The situation just seemed too big. It just seemed outside of God's control. And he just stopped trusting in Jesus's words. And that's exactly what was happening with these nine disciples. They just stopped trusting in Jesus' word. Have you ever been there? Are you there right now? What's going on in your life where God's word, the Bible, has made a promise or a truth clear, but because of this seemingly overwhelming circumstances and fear, you're having a hard time trusting his word. Maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it's an unexpected pregnancy. Maybe it's the inability to get pregnant. Maybe it's a job loss. Maybe it's a strained, strained marriage that just seems too far gone. Maybe it's a prodigal child. Maybe it's singleness while you long for marriage and your friends continue to get married. Maybe you're at rock bottom and Jesus' promise to give you life just seems too far out of reach. What is it for you that's making you think maybe all things don't work together for my good? Is there something that's causing you to think that way. Maybe God isn't really listening to my prayers or maybe God doesn't even care what's happening in my life. Oh, friends, he is worthy of your trust. His word is reliable. What should you do about this? I want to walk through just a few applications from this text for us to consider as we wrestle with, is God really trustworthy and what should we do about that? And we'll look back at this encounter with Jesus. And the first thing that we'll see as we look at some of the other accounts is God wanting us to ask him for help. So the first one is to ask God for help. So let's look at Mark 9 which is Mark's account of the exact same story. And we'll pick up in the middle uh, at verse 21, Mark 9, 21 through 24. And he asked, so Jesus asked this father, he says, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can... Do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. 
Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. What a relatable and paradoxical paradoxical statement. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Notice Jesus doesn't rebuke that statement. He rebuked the enemy of faith instead. This is what happened next. Picking back up in verse 24, it says, Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he got up. It's like when Peter was standing on the water and began to sink because he became frightened and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. And just look at how Jesus responds when we cry out for help. To cry out to him, I do believe, help my unbelief. To cry out to him, save me, so that he would stretch out his hand and take hold of you. And we see in this encounter with Jesus that in these moments of unbelief to ask God for help. What we also see is to trust in what he has said. To trust in what he has said. As you cry out to him to trust in what he has said by taking hold of his promises to you. Now to do this requires some discernment on your part. You see, God has promised certain things to um, us as his children. Uh, He's also, in in a general way, he's also promised things to specific individuals and groups of people in the Bible that are specific to them. And he's also not promised certain things. And you need to understand the context of his promises and whether or not they are meant for you. And so a couple examples in Luke 9-1, which we already read, he promised the, the disciples the power and authority to cast out all demons. He made that promise to them. He has not made that promise to you. But in Luke 6, 46 through 48, there's a promise for you. This is what it says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug, a deep, who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Now that's a promise to you. That when you come to Jesus and you hear his words and you put them into practice, you're building your life on a foundation that will not be shaken. And you can rely on that. You can trust in that word for you. You know, Romans 8, 28, that many of you know is not a cliche. It is a promise for you to hold on to with all of your heart. It says this, and we know that God causes all things, the good things, the bad things, the indescribable, horrible things that happen, all those things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's why in Hebrews 11.1, it says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You may not see the good that he is doing in the circumstances that you're encountering, but he will. Be like Sarah and consider him faithful who has promised. And so you can trust in what he has said. And there's another application of this passage, which is to exercise what has been entrusted to you. To exercise what has been entrusted to you. So you see the, the apostles were gifted to heal and to, and to cast out demons. And they failed to exercise their gifts in a meaningful way in this passage. And every person who is in Christ has been visited by the Spirit of God and been given a gift for the purpose of ministry. Now, we don't all have the same gifts, 
but those who believe are gifted to participate in the ministry of the kingdom of God. Romans 12, 6 through 8 says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the portion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortion, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And I just know for me, when I've been on the sidelines and and just not participating in ministry or in the mission of God, I slowly wither because it's one of the primary ways that I get to be encouraged by seeing God work and by having my faith tested and strengthened through being engaged in the work that God has for me. And I know that there are seasons where you might need to scale back certain ministry activities in order, in order to love God uh, more faithfully and other to, in order to love others more faithfully. And, and that's great. But I also know that there are some of you um, who have ceased exercising the gifts that God has given you for the purpose of ministry. And for your own heart's sake, you just got to get back in the game. You know, we've got an abundance of unfilled opportunities to serve not only the church, but to serve children and to serve uh, the community around us. In kids ministry, we have room for 60 more folks between midweek pre-K and elementary to serve kids. We have room for more than 90 volunteers to sign up within the next few weeks to mentor under-resourced fourth graders at, at Liberty Elementary right down the road for just nine Fridays in the school year for an hour and a half to get to love your neighbor and build a relationship with someone in the community. And just what an incredible opportunity to utilize the gifts that God's given you and they're just right there for the taking. You could sign up today and be equipped and ready to go. There's so many great opportunities to meaningfully deploy your gifts and to be encouraged, to have your faith strengthened, to be encouraged by seeing God work through you. And so to exercise what has been entrusted to you. And then the last one we'll look at is to behold the cross. And let's look at the last couple verses of our passage to close. It says at the end of this Luke 9, 37 through 45 passage, it says, But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. For the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement. And it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. And so Jesus knew the disciples, the apostles, needed to have their faith strengthened because he was going to the cross. But now Jesus' disciples, meaning you and me, we, need to, uh, we can have our faith strengthened because he went to the cross. See, he wanted to see their faith strengthened because he was going. And now that that's happened, we can have our faith strengthened because of what he has done. And what he demonstrated on that tree was his ultimate trustworthiness. Among other things, he demonstrated his ultimate trustworthiness to you. That in the midst of his suffering, he could have simply got down. But because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And that joy set before him was relationship with you that you could have fellowship with Christ because of what he was going to accomplish on that cross. And that is the ultimate sign of his trust, the trustworthiness of his word. That in his suffering, he would accomplish your justification before God and reconciliation with God. And now you can have life and have it to the full if you would but have faith. And so what we see from this passage is God wants us to trust in his word, to have faith in him, to hang on to that faith 
And to do so, we have to ask God for help. We've got to ask him for help. We've got to trust in what he has said. He has made promises to you that you can hang on to, but you need to do the work to understand which ones are meant for you and exercise what he has been given to you. He has given you gifts to use for your own encouragement and for the building up of the body and of the kingdom and to behold the cross, the work that he has done. And so we're going to take a few minutes to pray through these exact things that we would respond to what God has shown us in this passage. And so let's pray together. I'm going to pray and then prompt you to spend some time praying as well. Let's pray. You, the Lord, alone have declared what is to come from the distant past. There is no God apart from you, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none beside you. You are God and there is no other. So take a moment to express your own thoughts of praise and worship toward God. Father, we confess that there are times where the circumstances that we encounter just seem too significant for your word to be reliable. That the hardships we face, that the struggles we face seem just too big for you to overcome. And so God, we confess that now, that there are moments where we lack faith because our circumstances seem too great. So take a moment to confess those areas in your life where you are struggling to trust that God is reliable. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What grace that we can confess our sins to you and then thank you for your forgiveness. And so thank God for his forgiveness of you. And now, God, we want to just spend time to ask for your help. That what we saw the father of that boy do was cry out to you for help in his unbelief. What we saw Peter do was cry out for help. That he needed you to save him. And you were glad to reach out your arms. So, God, we come before you to ask for your help. So ask God for the things that you need help with. Particularly the things that you're struggling to believe God to be reliable in. And God, we affirm your word is true. God, your word is inspired It is infallible, it is our authority, it is our conscience, it is our guide, and we affirm that we can trust in what you have said because it is you who have said it. And so take a moment to affirm your trust in God's word. And lastly, Father, we thank you for the cross. 
that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that we would be justified before God, that we would be reconciled to you by grace through faith. We thank you for the gift of salvation that we have freely received because we have heard your word and responded in faith that we believe what you have said is true, that we have peace with you for now and for all eternity, and that we can look forward to the ultimate hope of being united to you in your presence. God, we thank you for the cross. So thank, take a minute to thank God for his work on your behalf. Father, as we turn our hearts back towards worship, would you stir our affections for you that we would rejoice that you are our only hope in life and death, that we would see you as who you are and trust you because you are God. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.